When somebody is in denial of an addiction, is there any way on earth that they're going to be able to effectively deal with it? There you have it. But, but are you saying that everybody is doomed to addiction because of the hum hunger for love when we were kids or when we were seeking mother? So everybody is doomed to addiction in some kind of form. Yeah, we we are we are in an addiction right now. Yes. By virtue of you being you, you're addicted to yourself. You're attached to your own self-image. And how easy would it be to walk away from that? It would involve a, a psychotic break. Do you see, this, this attachment is positive in certain regards. We need it. And, and it can also grow out of control as a cancer in our body. So addiction could be like the basis of addiction from a medical point of view is different than the basis of addiction from a psychological point of view. My own my own personal belief through experience would be that addiction comes out of pain. But certain doctors might say, well, addiction is to do with the dopamine do, dopamine receptors burning out and and the ability to want more want more want more do you see there's 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 a dulling down within our ability to feel pleasure but you know if you look at areas of high addiction in society, there are also areas of high pain. So addiction is an escape from pain. We engage, we engage something to distract us, something that involves pleasure. I was. <coughs> I was thinking about the difference of, of addiction in men and women. Do you see any difference? The purpose of addiction, why the reasons for addiction in men, are they the same reasons as the reasons for addiction in women? What do women get? And what do men get? Yeah. When you say addiction, it's kind of a big topic, but when, you, when you're kind of addicted, to sexual relationships or something, I think it's different for men and women. Okay, so pushing it, pushing it, applying the categories of engaging and disengaging. The addiction that pulls you into something, an addiction that gives you power to escape something. Like, it's two sides of the one coin. Say, for example, a sex addiction. A person, you could say, is addicted to the pleasure, to the physical sensations, to the feelings of contact, connection, wholeness, to the orgasm. And you could also say that it it's it's a way of escaping reality, the reality of of difficult contact, of broken relationship, of judgment, of shame. Are are we moving towards something or are we pulling away from something within Attachment, when we attach to something. Is, is is my question clear, I wonder? No, it's not. Is addiction no power over something or is it a disempowerment? 
am I seeking to have power over? Or am I seeking, is it an expression of my no power? Do I become powerful within addiction or to become powerless within addiction? Yep. Say when you were, when you are addicted to the feeling of, of uh, getting confer confirmation from the mail, from the mail, then you mm -hmm. go toward and, and and state of pleasurement, but you at the same time running from from the reason why you need that confirmation. There's both aspects in it, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So so in Ireland certainly, yep, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because that reminds me about the, you know, the, uh, the full push, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, you know, I saw this picture when I was reading Nathan Scott Sellen with the duck, duck and the rabbit, you know, whether it is it is, it's, it, you know, the, it contains both at the same time. Yeah. You know, so, so there's like a pull and a push. At the same time, and it's like, I think that's that, that has also to do with these early traumas before, you know, before three months of time before you have uh, your object. Yeah. Substance. Isn't it? So it's, so this is, it's so complex. It is, it is. It See, is it's not, complex. it's not simple. It's not straightforward. Absolutely oh, not straightforward. Oh. So in Ireland, I remember hearing it said that most women, it, there was a study done and it, it came up with the result that women drink for power and men drink for escape. So within alcoholics, I suppose you could extend it to drug, drug addicts as well, abuse of drugs. Uh, women drink for power and men drink to escape. Wasn't there a time where it was kind of cool seeing a woman with a cigarette because it was a woman with a cigarette? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know. Images, social images. And and if you go back to the idea of power, women are male on the inside. So as they access these internal dynamics they're moving towards a masculine a masculinized environment this animus environment men having femininity on the inside anima on the inside are moving more to an emotional environment so so naturally as men become powerless within themselves outside, they fall into their emotional hell on the inside. And women, as they become overwhelmed on the outside, fall into a more driven, type of place, a harder place on the inside. Now, I'm just making that point. I'm not emphasizing that point as anything important, but it's another part of when you meet people. You're meeting the, the whole person. You're, 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 the addiction is the creative response to a life problem. The addiction is not in itself wrong. It, it's, it's the means to an end. It's what this person has created. It's what has, a, what has become alive within the person. It's their solution. Okay. 
So, so the development of the addictive type within us is based on this broken attachment, this experiencing a block to our needs being met. Not, not just our needs being met or not being met, but experiencing the block, the obstacle, the parental power that stood in the way of satisfaction. So as the Gestalt cycle was being blocked, it, it involved an external force. The block didn't just arise by itself, raging against the machine. Do, do you know, the, the baby raging against the parental presence. And then the addiction or the addictiveness is perhaps the way around the shortcut. You know, it's like it's like when there's too much electricity coming into the house and the fuse blows or the trip switch blows, trips. It's, it's the way around. It's the short circuit. <clears throat> it becomes the cre creative response. So if access to Eros is blocked, if a parent has no time for the child, if access to Eros is blocked, well, then everything in the child organically is going to look for an alternative. You don't just give up on life. But what you do give up on is the pain, the fuse blows. So we split. And that awful moment gets put into the unconscious. And it continues to grow in the shadow. Along with all of the other awful moments. So guys, Jung, Jung says that the way out of an addictive pattern is, is very simply through the activation of the transcendent function. He says, the way out is up. And he reckons that's the only way out. So we've got to raise our consciousness. Now, in raising our consciousness, what happens? What happens to the old unfinished business? What happens to the old coex systems? When there's this sudden increase in awareness. <clears throat> what happens to the meal if you suddenly turn the heat up? Sorry, sir. Could you repeat that? Yeah, what happens to the meal if you suddenly turn the heat up on the cooker? It It burns off. It goes black. It enters into a state of negredo. When the heat gets turned up in a transcendent sort of way, alchemy is happening. It's not just an experience of ecstatic. It's not just a very exciting, pleasurable experience on the outside. The transcendent experience is something that's coming through us from the center. You know, people walking home from the church talking to God, is that is that a transcendent experience? 
or are they just talking to God in their imagination? People coming home from the church who suddenly enter into an ecstatic state and experience God within them, within their own self. Is that their imagination or is that something far greater? Do you see, so so the transcendent function is is something that happens from the deepest level within us. And it comes through us to the outside. It's not something that's happening on the outside only. It's not within our ability to turn it on and turn it off. So one, one of the, how can I say this? One, one of the points within the AA program would say that you've got to be as passionate about imp implementing the program as you are about your addiction. So you're replace you're you're basically replacing passion with passion, a healthy passion with an unhealthy passion. You're offering your passion a new path. You're moving your addiction into a positive area of your life. I'm going to do 30 meetings in 30 days. Do, do you see, I'm, I'm going to get involved with this fellowship. This fellowship is going to provide a, con a container. It's like it's like it's going to be me. I'm placing myself into this. Now. <clears throat> guys, where are you at with this? Are you are you are you still with me? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Is it possible to deal with this without the involvement of a higher power? What's your what's your opinion? What's your guess? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Well, so what function does the higher power serve within our psychological system? How does it work? Function. Yeah. So, so the presence of the higher power, the presence of the transcendence, what does it connect with inside of us? What is, what is it? Where's the ice that needs to be melted? Ego self axis. Again, from Groff, he says, non-ordinary states of consciousness tend to work like an inner radar system, seeking out the most powerful emotional charges and bringing the material associated with them into consciousness where they can be resolved. Non-ordinary states of consciousness, the transcendent function, that touch with the higher power, that, that involvement with wholeness, when we suddenly experience love, self-acceptance, non-ordinary states of consciousness tend to work like an inner radar system. They seek out the most powerful emotional charges and bring the material associated with them into consciousness where they can be resolved. In this process, previously hidden unconscious material 
comes to the surface. So guys, the addiction is a means to healing ourselves. Yeah. Say that the, the hole inside you, which you feel filling with addiction and such, the only thing that can stop that hole is the higher power. The only thing that can fill that hole quickly is is the higher power is like why why does psychedelic work why is it so effective in treating addiction yeah exactly the higher power the transcendence but what the transcendence is working on is the split off parts of ourself that we can't get at it's the structure within us that we have no access to because it is us. Do you see the, the root of the addiction is so unconscious that it's hidden within us. We can't get at it in order to dig it out of the ground. So, so through going into a fellowship program, and using the program as a container, that helps us to put manners on the addiction. It, it, it gives us a certain control over our behavior. And then through working through the different steps, through, through engaging with the spiritual practices, which are usually involved in, in a a rehab program, you know, meditation, prayer, all these different things. This is seeking to activate these non-ordinary states of consciousness within us, which will seek out these emotional parts within the coex and bring them to the surface. So if, if the addiction is centered around power and the power that I seek is the power to be able to avoid my pain. You know, may, maybe going to the races and being down in the betting arena, the betting ring, where all the TikTok men, you know, the the guys who are passing the betting slips, and maybe that environment is so exciting, becomes so exciting that it lifts me out of my pain. It's the nearest thing to a transcendent moment that I can have. Or maybe it's shooting heroin into my arm. Or ketamine. Do, do you see? it? It's that moment of escape from my pain. That touch of the transcendent within me that I'm seeking. But it's, it, it's so temporary. There was, there was, uh, the short-term benefit, long-term harm with no exit. The description of addiction. Short-term benefit, long-term harm with no exit. What is an addiction? Short-term benefit, long-term harm with no exit. Yeah. Who's that? Any addiction that's healthy for us. Say again. Yeah. 
Would it let, yeah. Uh, she's asking if there's addictions that are healthy or good for us. Give me an example of one. <laughs> I think I think it wouldn't be seen as an addiction. It might be seen as an attachment. I think addiction, the word addiction is used to something which is causing us harm. But I think there there are plenty of things that we attach to which are very, very useful. But they may not be seen as an addiction, something that's gone out of control, which is going to destroy us. I think the compensatory function in the psyche is always going to be made up of checks and balances. The seesaw of the mind. There's always going to be a compensatory function. What I don't get here, I look for over there. So we enter in and out of addictive type relationships. And each one of those relationships is like a waypoint on the journey or on the path towards wholeness. The, the relationship was never supposed to work. The relationship was intended to fail. But it's brought me to a place where I am now conscious. You see, we we if if we see ourselves as something <clears throat> across time, well, then we're not going to fix importance to any specific outcome. If I see myself as one thing within time, I am now. This is all that I am. Then the outcome is important. To enter into a process, we've got to see ourselves as something that stretches across time. I can survive this. I can hold the tension of this moment as I move into the next moment. I can enter into a process of recovery. I don't need it to happen right now. Do, do you see there's a learning? There's, there's a transcendent process. There's an alchemical process going on where I am becoming more. In a way, the addiction is healing me. The chaos of the addiction as it as it breaks into my life. It's an encounter with the shadow. And if I can survive it, I will learn from it. Guys, we're going to have a break. Okay, heavy duty stuff. We're going to have a break. Uh, cup of tea time. Um, I'm pausing this. Oh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, guys, any questions? While we're waiting on the few people to come back, any any questions? Yeah. So, my question is if you can with. Uh... Fragmentation and splitting, they're different but joined. Yes. And I feel we talked about splitting but not fragmentation. Okay. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, fragmentation is what it is. It's broken. You know, the vase is broken the bottle is broken the mug is broken it's there's piece of it pieces of it everywhere you know, you drop your mug on the floor and it fragments the pieces are going to go everywhere we're splitting something it it's much less than fragmenting 
So we use splitting in our everyday life. But it's it's not that it's like you might say somebody who splits away from you is quite rude. They're ignoring me. They're they're they just walked away. That was very rude of them. But fragmentation is much deeper. Guys, what do you think? Fragmentation splitting, what's the difference? I, I have an intuition into this that, that, that it comes together. If the if you know it's it's two two sides of, of the same coin, two you know yep. of the coin, it's like uh, they belong <clears throat> they belong somehow together. Mm -hmm. uh, so splitting in 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 the splitting concept, fragmentation lives, and in the fragmentation concept, you, you know if you go in one fragment, you can split that. Yeah. And if you if you know if it's just that there's nothing that that is really um it's like I, I have used this, you know, I have been experiencing this fragmentation and it's like, oh, I have a corner of my life now, yeah. And suddenly something over and in the, the opposite corner, it's like oh, suddenly I'm there and it, everything falls apart again and, and there's a whole life in, in this fragmented life. It's you change life. fragments. Yeah, yeah, you move. Yeah, exactly. Your your identity is split between fragments. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, I, so I so can move. Work, yeah. The whole work have, has been around getting all these pieces, you know, yeah. uh, come together. And, and I'm absolutely, you're absolutely dead right. I think that you, you cannot do that without the presence of God or the self or something higher presence in you yeah it's not possible so this this splitting can I, can I ask something yes yeah well to me splitting i mean um if when i split i can i can voluntarily uh grasp the different uh pieces or personas i've split into and bring them forth <laughs> When I'm fragmented, do they these fragments do they sort of take hold in the unconscious and I stumble across them sometimes? Or it, yes, it, yes, to what you're of, saying, yes, they, they sort of they get out of reach voluntarily, but I can stumble mm. across them or they present themselves by their own will sometime. That's it, absolutely. They have an autonomy within themselves people people who are more schizoid type will do a lot more splitting and people who are more hysterical type will do less splitting Pe people who are more hysterical type will have tantrums they'll have arguments they they will be twisted out of shape. But people who are more schizoid type will will become cold and unfeeling. And the coldness and the unfeeling is to do with having split. So so the tantrum has to do with some fragment with its own autonomy suddenly barging into my the the tantrum is saying, I haven't moved on. I haven't let go of this. This is not over for me. And there's more, and there's more, and there's more. Do you, do you see? And do you remember when you said this? And do you remember when you did that? It's pulling, it's pulling all of the unfinished pieces that are still in me out. The tantrum. 
is 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 all of my unsplit off parts coming out in an avalanche where whereas the split off parts of myself are gone so this has now, some... they can surface as hella said they can surface suddenly and i wake up like yesterday i woke up happy today i wake up depressed do, do you see what is the difference in me between yesterday and today? I'm been organized by a different fragment, perhaps. Yeah. And the fragment has its own autonomy. The fragment is like a mini me. It has its own karma. It has its own unconscious. It has its own root to the collective unconscious. And in having its own root into the collective unconscious, it has its own karma. So could a fragment be a coex? A fragment will have coexes. The, the coex is more the organizational structure. Whereas the fragment is, is something of the psyche itself. Like if I if I took a chainsaw and I cut your arms and legs off with the chainsaw, all of those parts, arms, legs, torso, they're all parts of you. They're not coexes. They're parts of you. They belong. You 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 are them, they are you. The fragments are parts of you. The coexes are more to do with how the material inside of you is channeled, organized, how it comes to the surface this moment in life. Condensed experience. Oh. Systems of condensed experience. So so a, a coex could actually have representations from different fragments. Yes. The co a, a coex that gets triggered. Where where Jung talks about complexes, Groff talks about coexes. So a coex that gets triggered has its own creative. It, it, it it's like a line of dominoes. It's a it's a channel through which libido flows. So this libido itself is the life energy, creative energy. So the coex is creating as, as the domino effect passes forward. It's creating in my mind, in my perception, in my images, and it's creating out into the world through the projected energy of itself. I'm meeting my imagination. I'm meeting my expectation. But the fragment is a mini me. It's like it's like you go outside and you look at a tree and there's a vine growing up around the tree. Is it is it the vine or is it the tree? If the vine has been growing around the tree for 50 years, the vine could be as thick as the tree. Is it the vine or is it the tree that I'm looking at? Which fragment am I looking at? Which belongs to which? Where's the main identity? The main identity could be in this fragment or the main identity might be in that fragment. Somebody who falls into addiction is like somebody who's possessed by their shadow. But the shadow is a fragment. Do you, do you see, do they have their shadow or does their shadow have them? Which part is living at the moment in the person's life? Is it the vine or is it the tree? I'll read something here. This will make more sense. I'll read this. <clears throat> The 
The research dealing with non-ordinary states of consciousness has given us new insights into the relative importance of postnatal biographical material. In mainstream psychiatry, we consider traumatic experiences in early childhood, along with more recent events in the client's life, to be the key sources of neurosis and psychosomatic disorders. So, with a few exceptions, psychiatric psych psychiatry feel that psychotic disturbances cannot be understood in purely psychological terms. Okay, so I'll, I'll read that bit again. Research dealing with non-ordinary states of consciousness has given us new insights into the relative importance of postnatal biographical material. In mainstream psychiatry, we consider traumatic experiences in early childhood, along with more recent events in the client's life, to be the key sources of neurosis. So we're looking at the stuff of your life and the stuff of the earliest part of your life, postnatal experiences. Psychiatry and psychotherapy generally deals with what you can remember. And a little bit before that. Through observing clients in non-ordinary states, we discover that their neurotic or psychosomatic symptoms often involve more than their biographical level of the psyche. Through observing clients in non-ordinary states, we discover that the neurotic or psychosomatic symptoms often involve more than the biographical level of the psyche. Initially, we may find that the symptoms are connected with traumatic events that the person suffered in infancy or childhood, just as described in traditional psychology. However, when the process continues and the experiences deepen, the same symptoms are found to be related to particular aspects of the birth trauma. So you can follow it in. The, the further in you go, the more back, you, you know, the further back you go. Additionally, additional roots at the same of the same issue can then be traced even further to transpersonal sources. For example, an experience in a past life, an unresolved archetypal theme, or the person's identification with a specific animal. Thus, a person suffering, say, from psychogenic asthma might first re relive one or more childhood events involving suffocation, such as a near drowning, suffering from whooping cough, or a bout of diph diphtheria. A deeper source of the same problem can be the near suffocation of this person while in the birth canal. On the transpersonal level, the asthmatic symptoms might be related to past life experiences of being strangled or hanged, or even elements of animal consciousness, such as identification with an animal victim smothered by a boa constrictor. For complete resolution, of this form of asthma, it is important to confront and integrate all of the different experiences connected with the problem. So, guys, this is where it's important to ask the question, is it the vine or is it the tree? And also, what ground is the tree growing in? Was that growth? Writing this is gruff, yeah, yeah, gruff again. So if I talk to the client, the client can talk to me about what they remember. If I talk to the body of the client, the body can talk to me about all of the experiences that it has ever had, all the way back to conception. However, if I talk to the psyche of the client, the psyche can bring me further in and talk to me about this karmic structure, this generational handing down, which is so evident within addiction. 
where is the deepest root of the addiction situated? When you see addiction in a family, very often it's multi-generational. So what are you looking at? You're looking at something that is extending across many generations. Do you see, it's not just within the biographical story of the person. It's within their root. It's within the structure of the person. It, it's, it's coming from somewhere deeper. Now, <clears throat> uh, deep experiential work has revealed similar multi-level structures in other conditions treated by psychiatrists. Deep experiential work has revealed similar multi-level structures, multi-level structures in other conditions treated by psychiatrists. The perinatal levels of the unconscious, which we explored in the first chapters of this book, are important repositories of difficult emotions and sensations and are frequently are frequently found to be the source of anxiety, depression, feelings of hopelessness and inferiority, as well as aggression and violent impulses. Reinforced by later traumas from infancy and childhood, these early, early wounds reinforced by later traumas from infancy and childhood, this emotional material can lead to various phobias, depressions, sadomasochistic tendencies, criminal behavior, and hysterical symptoms. <clears throat> so you're, you're looking at a system in motion. It's more than a person. You existed before you existed. Your being existed before you appeared. That being inside of you has roots. It's a plant. You're the flower on the plant. You've only come in. You've only appeared in the last 50 years or so. But the plant is a lot older. Do you see? Now, the, the involvement of a higher power in the healing of addiction. The involvement of this transcendent activation within the healing of addiction is an alchemical process because it's coming from the inside. I have another bit here I want to read to you. Uh, just, just, okay, this bit and then another bit. Additional observations suggest that suicidal tendencies, alcoholism and drug addiction also have perinatal roots. Of special significance seems to be the liberal use of anesthesia during childbirth. Can you, can you repeat that bit? Additional observations suggest that suicidal tendencies, alcoholism and drug addiction also have perinatal roots. Of special significance seems to be the liberal use of anesthesia during childbirth. Certain substance, substances used to ease the mother's pain teach the newborn on a cellular level to see the drug state as a natural escape route from pain and difficult emotions. These findings were recently confirmed by clinical studies. Yeah. Yeah, 
Well, that's really, yeah. Do you see? Yes. It's interesting. Okay, so so the next bit I want to give to you from this, and this is to do with psychotherapy in general and healing practices. In most existing psychotherapy systems, the goal is to understand how the psyche works and why emotional disorders develop. Their goal in therapy is to use the theories to develop use the theories they develop to change the way clients think, feel, behave, and make life decisions. So that's psychotherapy in action. We're working with the client to help them improve how they think, how they feel, how they behave, and the decisions that they make. Even in the most non-directive forms of psychotherapy, the therapist is considered to be the key vehicle for the healing process because he or she possesses knowledge and training superior to the client. So you are the facilitator of the change. Through your knowledge, through your experience, through your own work, you carry this into the room and you facilitate this within the client. Okay. Now, uh, where is it? The problem is that few schools of therapy agree about the most fundamental issues concerning the mysteries of the human psyche, the nature of psychopathology, or even therapeutic techniques. The approach to the same disorder differs according to the personal belief systems of the therapist and to the school he or she belongs to. There have been no conclusive studies showing that certain schools are superior to others in getting therapeutic results. It is known that good therapists of different schools get good results and bad therapists get poor results. However, the resulting changes in clients seem to have very little to do with what the therapists believe they are doing. It has been suggested that the success of psychotherapy might have nothing to do with the therapist's technique, technique and content of verbal interpretations, but depends on factors such as the quality of the relationship in the therapeutic setting, the degree of empathy or the client's feelings of being understood and supported. It's all about love. It's all about love. Now, in working with non-ordinary states of consciousness, which involves the transcendent function and the higher power and AA programs, 12-step programs and such like, in working with non-ordinary states of consciousness, the roles of therapist and client are quite, are quite different from those in traditional psychotherapy. The therapist is not the active agent who causes the change in the client by specific interventions, but is somebody who intelligently cooperates with the inner healing forces of the client. This understanding of the role of the therapist is in congruence with the original meaning of the Greek word therapeutes, which means the person who assists in the healing process. It is also in agreement with C.G. Jung's approach to psychotherapy, wherein it is believed that the task of the therapist is to mediate for the client a contact and exchange with his or her inner self, which then guides the process of transformation and individuation. So, so the role of the therapist is different when working within the field of addiction. The role of the therapist is to constellate this transcendent function and to bring in the higher power 
which is going to kickstart the alchemical process which alters the root of the client. The bit that you can't get at, it's beyond biographical memory, the structure, the karmic structure that leads to the implantation, that leads to the bad womb experience, that leads to the birth experience. The, birth experience. the role of the therapist is to constellate this alchemical process. Do you, do you see that you're 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 sitting in front of a system? Is it the vine? Is it the tree? You're sitting in front of a complete system. The addiction is only the visible part. The addiction is where this psychological pathology has broken the surface. And this is extending itself through generations within a family. Now, there's no way you're going to heal that on your own. It has to involve this higher power. Now, the chaos of the addiction needs to be contained. And this is where a fellowship program, an AA program, is absolutely perfect. So by getting somebody into meetings, by directing somebody towards an AA program or a Gamblers Anonymous program or an NA program, Narcotics Anonymous, or a fellowship program if it's a sexual addiction. Do you see? By, by directing the person and literally making it a condition of therapy. I can't work with you if you're not going to go to meetings. What you're doing is you're you're creating a container for this alchemical process to kickstart. Without that container, there is no container other than yourself. Now, do you want to be bringing that client's chaos home with you and sitting down to dinner with it and going to bed at night with it? and get up in the morning with it? No. Your own personal boundary says no. So, so you enlist the help of a fellowship, of a recovery program, of rehab, and you push the person towards it. So guys, questions on that? There's a lot in that. Yes. That has to be a, a short term fellowship, or is a fellowship as the container enough? It could be enough. If if the person goes to a good meeting, if the person has a good sponsor, if the meeting is is active in working the steps if it's a 12 step program, then that might be enough. But I would say not enough. But it becomes the first intervention in the addictive cycle, which could be generations old. To you see you're you're, you're trying to kill the snake and save the patient. But you got to get the snake up out of the ground. Now, the snake can be dealt with by the psyche through through the transcendent function. See, why, why, why is ayahuasca so good at, with addiction? Why does LSD work so well? because of this transcendence. Go on, yeah. You know that the 12 steps uh, fellowship is not allowing the psychedelic experience. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Put an addicted person into fellowship, you you kind of say that 
the other psychedelic experience is not allowed somehow in the United States, but see there's there's always going to be a difference in the route the path the client takes some people will will automatically wish you know they will want to work with it in a certain way but for most people it's going to be a 12-step program now in term in terms of your position in the room do you find that interesting that that your position in the room in working with addiction is to facilitate this transcendent experience. You're 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 specifically working in a different way with the addiction than if somebody was to come in and say, "Listen, I'm having problems at work." You know, if somebody comes in and say, I, I, I'm depressed, I'm problems at work, I'm being bullied, this is going on, that's going on. You're you're working within the biographical experience of the person. You're working with their complexes. You're working with what you can get at. Those sort of experiences don't have the same depth of root as addiction would have. When somebody comes in within addiction, it's it's a different story. You're looking at something so much deeper. And suicide, the same. So guys, where are you at with this? What's happening for you? Do you want to do you want to take five minutes, break into twos, threes, take five minutes to talk about what it is you're realizing, and then come back into the full group and let's see what questions there are. Okay. So maybe pair off with each other one on one. And take a few minutes each way to talk about whatever it is that you're realizing, hearing, understanding. And we'll have, will we have one group of three? Okay, guys, what, uh, what are you realizing or what have you, have, how have you moved within this? Is there anything you're surprised at or interested in within it? Yeah, yeah. Well, this this one um, fascinating thing that in order to survive, uh, we 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 need to uh, we are born with with the addiction because we need to be able to crave our mother's service. So, mm. so we're actually born with the need for the addiction; otherwise, we wouldn't survive. Yes, yes, and and in potential. Yeah. Okay, in potential, but if 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 I let's let's say I um I get milk from my mother, I get her attention. 
and I am I am everything. I, I'm I'm not as what you said before. I I just am. Um, I need to have a feedback mechanism that says this is what I need to survive. So the feedback yes. mechanism is sort of like the dopamine in the brain, or I don't know whatever. But this feedback me mechanism makes me want to create more. And yes. if I don't, if the feedback mechanism does not exist, I will cease to exist. So I'm born with with the mechanism that. Uh, um, results or could result in addiction. Well, I would say results in addiction. Yes, in effect, yes. And Carl Rogers might say that that is an example of how the psyche is a self-regulating mechanism. It's a self-regulating organism. It, it creates its own solutions. We we are the jockey on the horse, but the horse is taking us for a ride. In the same way, psychosis could be seen as a positive healing within a generational structure. It could be is huge for the person, a, a, a disaster for the person at a personal level. And yet it is something working its way through a family structure. It could bring healing for so many others in the family. Seeing seeing the seeing an addiction in a holistic way. Can you see the addiction in a holistic way? Yes. I, I don't know if it, but I, Mary and I, we, we talked about, we both have given birth to two sons and birth experiences have been very different where one has had an epidural as one child was born with the help of epidural and the other one not mm. talked about, you know, now seeing our children differently because of how they came into the world. Yeah. See my oldest son's. Uh, I, I'm now realizing <laughs> my oldest son's addiction pattern uh, with marijuana and other substances, and whereas my youngest son doesn't have the same. He's more like, okay, I taste it. Do I like it? No, I don't. Okay, then I throw it away. Like he's not. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing and unnerving at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and it it seems to fit in this case. Yeah. You, you know what you're saying it seems to fit for you. It, yeah. It, it it starts the reflection anyway. To yeah. Yeah. It may not fit in every family exactly like that, but it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I've always thought that I know there's addiction in my family line. And mm. I always thought that that was the sole, you know, uh, reason why. But now I can yeah. have more roads coming in. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Yes. But does it have have to be that it ends out in addiction? Doesn't. Doesn't we all have a headache and sometimes take a Panadil, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Everybody uh, uh, do something to do to uh, relieve the pain. But that's Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Have to be when the the like you're all, no. Yeah, the energy might move sideways, and I end up with arthritis. Do you know what I mean? I could, it could come out physically in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. But when, when you're as a therapist, when you're working with clients, you've no, you've no power over who's going to walk in through the door. 
So when this comes in through the door, it's good to have an understanding of what it is and to be able to see it, not through the eyes of, of the client or through society's eyes. Because addicts hold the shadow for society. You know, somebody who, like like there's when I when I worked in some of the centres in Dublin, where there'd be a lot of addiction, uh, it was amazing to see a hierarchy within the addiction itself. So alcoholics were much better off than drug addicts. People who used drugs were the worst. Do you see, and gamblers just kept to one side. They they had a sort of category of their own. They didn't get involved with the alcoholics or the drug addicts. Do you see, so it was interesting to see that there's a hierarchy, that, that, that there's a personal experience being had within the addiction. The person is experiencing their own life with from inside their own addiction. They're not gone. In the case of a psychosis, the person could be gone, is gone. I, I wanted to move on. There's a little bit more ground I want to cover, but just are there any more points that anybody wants to raise from your own discussions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I need to ask help because... I need to make a sentence out of this. Um, I'm yeah, I'm just a bit forbidden uh, over for so no some as a give it this um cultural lay in a logic lay in some finas together. The book for you as a we <laughs> we have a discussion. I'm not sure what Umayo wants to ask, but it's something related to this addiction thing. Does it does it uh, show or surface uh, differently depending on the culture or depending on the anthropology? Or um... yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm sure it does. What do you think? I think it does. Yeah. Yeah, where, how do you see that, or where do you see that? Um, for me, uh, I, I'm not uh, born here in Denmark, I'm born in the Middle East, and some parts of the culture uh, mean something for the addiction I have. So this, yeah, but I'm not sure, I'm confused. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good to keep curiosity. It's good. Good to stay open to that and see well, what is it that that you're not sure of. Keep asking. Keep inquiring. Okay. There's uh, any any other comments want to be made? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what happens? What yeah. happens? Shadow of society for addicts. Yes. That's a great question. <laughs> society oh, creates creates more addicts. Do you, do you know society needs people that they can place their shadow on? The middle classes need the lower classes. The higher classes need the middle classes and the lower classes. You know this this structure within society of more power, less power. The wealthy and the, those in poverty, it, it it it's how society functions. You, you know, the unconscious needs somewhere to dump its garbage. So it chooses those who are less conscious. You know, and then we have wars mm -hmm. in the world. So there's a macro level and a micro level. Okay, so... Long sentence. The unconscious needs somewhere to dump its garbage. Yeah. 
how it dumps it on the less conscious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we could name them one by one. Putin. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Putin. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you could look inside your own family and see who you I have to say project that onto. Because, because maybe Putin is very conscious. Hmm. I have to say something here because because we, how, how, who are we to judge? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, about Hitler or who came down and took this huge task to, you know, to see what happened, see how how conscious was raised after the Second World War, for instance. Well, you could say he's been very responsible in not letting off a nuclear weapon, which I'm sure he has within his power to do. Yeah, or maybe Hitler, I was talking about Hitler or whoever, but, but maybe they did their, you know, the, 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 this dark side was really, really well done job. Yeah. There's, there's, in in the case of the addict, couldn't it be have have been done without? I mean, killing babies, you know, doing this these horrible horrible things are really something that brings us all up from the dead. Yeah, the genocide of the Jews, like yeah. Hitler, and what is Putin doing? He's doing the same. I, I think it's it's his needs. He, he might be learned, very conscious, but he also has a very large shadow that he cannot. That he's not aware of. But we have. Well, how do we know? Yeah, we well, we it's don't. not you to, to judge that. But would we kill other people? I do. Yeah. For the same reason? Not for the same Just, reason. For oh, other but, reason. That, but, but that's the difference. But Soren, there's he 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 represents wholeness. He does exactly within within all of us. He represents a part of us. Maybe maybe he is very aware of what he is doing, exactly. completely aware of what he was doing, and he is willing to enter into a genocidal war. Right. That that is his sadism. That is his vengeance, acting out, and and that is part of my shadow. I, I have a part in me that will deliberately hurt somebody else. And see, that's my point. I have yeah. it in me as well to kill another person. Absolutely, but yeah. The reasons are different. Yes. But that's where Jung would say the shadow is 90% gold and you leave the 10% evil where it is. You don't let that off the lead. Exactly. Yes. But he did. Oh, he he he, uh, he has found his reasons for doing that. Yes, I just want to move on to the addict because we've looked at this more from the position of the therapist, but from the position of the person who is in the addiction, um, it is an unconscious state of being. You could say they are living their shadow. Their shadow is living them, but it's, the shadow has been organized by a deeper aspect of shadow. How how has the shadow suddenly entered so much into the world of the person? Because it is empowered by a deeper shadow. So so the complex has taken over because of the archetypal core within the complex. If you if you see the addiction as the neur neurotic behavior, then why is it so strong? Why is it so effective? Because it is coming from somewhere deeper. Okay. So, so it's characterized by arrogance. <laughs> Denial. Denial. So the splitting that has taken place, the way the person self-manages, the way the person is able to avoid this awful self-image that they have of themselves, 
is through splitting that awful self-image away, getting rid of it, which creates this inflation. This inflated part of themselves becomes very arrogantly in charge. Do you see, when, when I cut away, when I split away from the heaviness of my own self-judgment, I immediately become airborne. I self-inflate. There's nothing wrong with me. Fuck off. It's none of your business. Do you, do you see? I'll do what I want. It's my life. And you can absolutely expect dishonesty. Because the person who is lost in addiction will have planned their source. So if it's alcoholism, they'll have bottles hidden everywhere. Do you see, if it's drugs, they'll have a second stash. If it's power, if you come at them from one angle, they just hit back from another angle. So this arrogance, this self-inflation, this self-protection is always going to be there. Protecting against their own self-attack, their own self-image, their own self-judgment. So it's very difficult to get somebody just to look at themselves when their image is so ugly, when it's so dark. So that that's why, shadow? yeah, go on. You say that is the shadow living itself, the inflated person? Yeah, absolutely. The shadow has taken over the house. Do you know, do you know what I mean? The whole thing is shadow based, but more than just shadow. It wow. it's also delusional. It's full of it. It's full of psychotic. You, you know, there's a collective thread coming through it. It it it's it's a dilution of the individual. They've been pulled right down in it, but the arrogance will be supreme. Arrogance will be king, so. Structure is so important within the recovery program because the person has lost their personal container. The person has lost their identity within it. So the person needs structure around them again. So medical intervention or group intervention. So the recovery programs are usually done within a group format because the group provides the container. It, it gives the person back their identity. It holds their identity up in front of them where they can't hold it up for themselves. It, it allows the unacceptable face of the addict to be discussed and noticed and referenced and the beginning of acceptance. So a lot, a lot of these programs will be based around lists. You'll you'll see, you know, the four S's, the five O's, the three T's. You know, whatever it is, there'll there'll be lists, and there'll be that sort of behavioral program in place because it's providing structure. What the person needs is structure. So so basically, the, the process of recovery is broken down into four stages. Your you've, you've, first stage is not ready. This is the way I would have experienced it, certainly in Ireland. First stage, not ready. That person is not ready. Then, then you could say the person is getting ready. And stage three is now they are ready. And stage four would be action. Okay, let's get them in. Do you see? And get them through the program. 
Now, equally, you could look at that in terms of no hope, hope, and path. There's no hope. And now there is hope. And now the person is on a path, path to recovery. So, so when you're discussing it, if you discuss it with a client, to be able to put it in these terms is giving, it's putting a structure into their imagination. It's rebuilding this idea of the self. This, this first basic need, I need to survive. It's giving them a way, you know, a path forward. And then the final stages in the recovery is relapse prevention. So, so every program ends with relapse prevention. And relapse prevention falls into three categories. There's, there's emotional relapse, there's mental relapse, and there's physical relapse. So again, you're breaking it down into a very structured sort of, you could nearly draw a chart. And, and this is all, the recovery process is, is completely immersed within structure because that's what the client needs most. Okay, so so the the you could say the transcendent is present within the entire process, but it really emerges in the final stages of the process where where the person starts to feel alive again. But but it's there from the very, very beginning, really. Okay, I think that's uh, that's all of that. <clears throat> Guys, this stuff this stuff is very available. If you if you are working with somebody who's in addiction, it's very useful to go on and to download. Uh, guidelines from one of the treatment centers. Uh, every treatment center will have resources. And a lot of them are online. Now, the one the ones that I would be familiar with over here would be run by Turning Point. Where Turning Point is also an international organization. But you would have ones in Denmark. If you go online and you look into these websites, there there possibly will be a resource available for clinicians, therapists, where where you can work alongside their recovery process, and it gives you an outline. It would give you an outline of what they do, and it's it's really worthwhile investigating. Yep. Yeah? Also have. AACA and NA in Denmark. Yes. All, all their stuff is available on, online. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. And and but to go actually into the detox centers website as well. Like if you can find out there will be publicly funded detox programs and there'll be privately funded detox programs. So if you go online and just check out which ones uh, some of them will have very well-developed websites and you'd be amazed at the information that's available in them. ACOA and th those sort of organizations, they, their information would be very specific for the users. Whereas, whereas what you're looking really for is the information for you as a clinician. Uh, it's much greater detail. So, you could you could check out the turning point website if you want. Um, there's an Australian. I, I think if I add it in here into the chat. Um, let's see.
That's, uh, can you see that? Has that appeared? Yeah. <laughs> There's clinicians guidelines on that website. That's quite a big website. Uh, that would be one that I would recommend. And there's a lot of material available. Uh, another another website that is very definitely worth um, reading, erwid.org. Oh, no, that's not spelled right. The second spelling, E-R-O-W-I-D, erwid.org. Erwid.org is a, it's a resource covering every possible drug imaginable. It's a huge website. If you can find your way in through the front page, the menu system on the front page is quite small. But if you go in through the front page, it opens up and it is a massive website full of information there's there's a library of drug users reports of what this did and what that did and how it affected me and everything everything is in it uh full of resources so anybody who's interested in addiction erwid is the first protocol. You want to find out about what's going on inside your body? Erowid. So a complete guide for inspiration to my next addiction. Yeah, exactly. You got to do it with awareness. <laughs> <clears throat> if you want to know how much mushrooms to use and of what type, Erowid. Do you know, it It. It really is. There's no, it's, it's very non-biased. Yeah, Lifesavability.com. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, it'll, you know, it's, it's a lot of these government organizations, they're very slanted and they don't give you full information, but that website does. Is there room for a question or how? Yeah, of course there is. I was, I was wondering when we, if we're dealing with, with addicts of different age, what would the impact be of, for instance, I mean, if I take my, um, my bring up as a baby um, my parents were told or my mother was told not to pick me up when I cried for hunger yeah. because um, babies were not to be spoiled this has changed within the past 50 years so like uh, people coming uh, 30 years old today would have uh, been brought up differently they would have then maybe they would have their needs met um, for hunger when, when they were hungry. Do, 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 do you get my question? What's, what's yes. the impact of this different um, approach to meeting the need from the baby uh, to their future addiction? Okay, I can't answer that, Soren. Because I it 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 would be I think it's too individual to say it would be different in every person, but uh, your your guess would be as good as mine. But what I would say is, um, and we do have some time here. If if uh, who's who's just gone outside the room there, one two three four five six seven. Have we lost one or two? Okay. Well, what I would suggest we can do this just for. A few minutes and just see see what happens and um, the invitation the exercise i want to suggest is that you all go into your addict take a moment locate your ad addicted self the character of your addict and just allow yourself to become your addicted self your addict and feel the nature of his character her character and I'm going to ask is when, when you're all in touch with your addict, your inner addict, I'm going to ask is just to mingle, 
just to stand up and just to introduce yourselves to each other through the character and personality of your addict. And just get a sense of what it is and how it operates in you. Is it an addiction to power? Is it a substance addiction? If so, what's the character type in you? Do you see? Is is it more to do with contact, touch, sexuality? Just see, see your see what it is inside yourself. We're just doing an exercise here. I'm just asking people to get in touch with their own inner addict. And when you're in touch with the character and the personality and persona of this person inside of you, just bring it to the surface and just give it a little bit of room to play. Let your shadow play a little bit so you can begin to see it. And I'm going to ask people to mingle in the room as you let your shadow out. And what if you have more than one? Well, I mean, that's up to you. You can let them out to play, but obviously, <clears throat> you know, we're not going to cause harm to anybody. <clears throat> and just get a sense of it yourself. Feel into it yourself. What basis in your own personality does your addict occupy? Does it hold? And just bring it for a walk in the room. <clears throat> so have a little chat with people, you know, do your normal, your normal social business with each other and just see how the shadow, see how your addicted self would come out in normal contact. And how subtle you would be about getting your needs met within your addicted self. And then when you feel you've played enough, when you've had sufficient time to explore it, you just bring yourself back. Put that part of your character back in its box. Maybe don't fasten the lid on it too much. Don't be as severe on it as you have been in the past. <clears throat> okay, guys, so, so back in the room. Another version of an unboxing video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anybody want to say anything about that? Well, my addict didn't want to meet anybody. It would isolate from him. Yeah. Him, him. I, I would not come out. I, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. I have troubles by figuring out what to do. Like, yeah. I know there is something, but it's like, the specific yeah. thing is like yeah, yeah, yeah. something with control maybe controlling things, but I don't like if you could give it an image, I wonder what sort of image you would express. 
to see if, if you were to use color and texture to express it. I wonder how it would look like. Would it be full of energy or would it be no energy? Was anybody surprised? Yeah, yeah, a few nodding heads. Why? What surprised you about that? Um, it felt more like a survival in a way, like an addiction to survival. Maybe coming back to what you said earlier about we're all we have an attachment to being human. Um, I don't know if you use those words interchangeably, but like it felt like that. Like, oh, this is that's all I want, really. Yeah. Is to survive. I'm very attached to being human, apparently. And also, I very much wanted to um, engage with people um, in that way. What did you want in it? What were you seeking? Is there a word you could use to say, this is what I was seeking? This is what my want is? Like if you if you work from the word survival and come forward on it, what what else? What do you get? I think I'm thinking of the word uh, mirroring or reflection or being seen. Something yeah. Like that. yeah. I want a response. I want you to respond to me. I want you to see me, yeah. to recognize me. To let me know who I am, to give me a name, to call my name, to pick me up, to hug me, to let me know that I'm important. Just, just see, just see the parental roles, the unmet needs. So, so the, the addiction of that could be an eating down. Could be what? It could be an eating down of all those feelings. So I'm going to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat until I burst. Do you, do you know, it could it could come out as drink it down. It could come out as cutting. But look, look at the emotion behind it. Look, look at the, the locked in self. It's also peculiar how she's looking for response and another is, is isolating. That's yep. Totally yeah, yeah, different experiences. Leave me alone, don't touch me. And yet secretly, secretly I might want safe touch, not dangerous touch or hurtful touch. Did you did you find anything in the character of the addict, like the subtlety of getting needs met, the cleverness? Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that, or what could you say about that? Mine is so arrogant. Yeah. <sighs> Ooh, I see someone who's not wanting to respond to me, and then I'm just like, mm, I need to just keep doing like this to respond. Yes. Yeah. Arrogant, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah it's interesting to, to look at our predator and to see our predator within. Do, do you know we all have a predator? within us you know and 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 to see the predator in its innocence and also in its danger and Jung says you take the shadow or von Franz said take the shadow for a walk but don't let it off the lead Get, you know bring it to life take some of the aliveness out of it but don't don't allow it to take over your life 
because it'll destroy your life. Okay, guys, we're moving to a close on this. Anybody else want to say anything? Just enough time, but I wonder, is, um, are eating disorders a, a form of addiction? Um, what do you imagine? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And also connected to those um, four initial stages, four trimesters. Mm. I think anything that, you know, again, go, going back to the uh, the breakdown of what is addiction, anything that gives us short term gains with long term losses. That doesn't provide an easy exit. So the short term gains, I feel good. with obvious long-term effects. Give me loads of sugar. Well, guys, I hope it's opened your eyes a little bit. You know what I mean? I hope, I hope it's been useful. Um, the whole psychiatric area is a heavy subject, but, uh, you know, object relations, read up on Freud, go back in, start doing your own research. It's not my job to be your parent, it's your job to be your own parent. So research it yourself, go online, start finding these things out for yourself, read up on them and educate yourself, feed yourselves. You do, you do need to know about this early developmental, these early, early developmental stages. You're going to see it in every single client. You're going to see it in yourself. So you need to know about it. So, okay, we're just about there. Any, any, anything else wants to be said or? If you have any questions that you feel you want to bring back to me afterwards, feel free. Just send me a message. I'll respond as best I can. Hella, can you say anything there? Want me to say something? Yeah, Hella, do you do you see anything that needs to be finished off in that, or are we good oh, to go? Uh, I think we're good to go, Stuart. I think uh, that was very. Um... A very good the last couple of uh, days session sessions yeah. where yeah I think it's very valuable. <clears throat> okay, guys. Well then, take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, whatever it is, and uh, I'll talk to you again at some stage, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We definitely do. Yeah. Okay. Thank bye. you, Stuart. Bye bye. bye, -bye.